Hello and welcome to India Career Center, the one-stop podcast for students, professionals, parents and guardians. In every episode, we will try to deal with a current topic that needs expert advice related to career, career guidance and career mentoring. Please welcome your host Dr. S.B. Mishra to the show and happy listening. Hello and welcome to India Career Center for another topic about uh, career guidance. We have today a very, very eminent guest, uh, Mr. Sunil Dhaya. Uh, Mr. Sunil Dhaya is the Executive Vice President from Vadwani Opportunity, uh, which is under the Vadwani Foundation. Mr. Sunil uh, leads the Vadwani Opportunity Program in Asia and also expanding its footprints across emerging economies. Uh, he has got about over 25 years of experience in the vocational training uh, area. Uh, he has undertaken several initiatives at NIIT. He has contributed to building Industry Connect for placing over uh, 200,000 students, uh, co-founded a business venture called uh, the Stack Route. Sir, to take this conversation forward, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome you formally to this show. And uh, if you can tell uh, our viewers about your early life, your early career uh, in India and um, how you have come to this stage in this current uh, profession. Sure. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And let, let, let me uh, give a background and I, just to answer what, what you just asked. So see, from the journey standpoint, uh, when I look back, it's now you know, three decades of journey, more or less, uh, kind of, I'm completing three decades now, uh, have been all throughout in the vocational uh, education and training space. So learning and development, education, methodology, pedagogy, these are very, very close to heart uh, terms all throughout. Uh, but as you, you know, as so the, the way the journey began, it was, uh, you know, it was 91, uh, you know, when the journey began. And, you know, that was the time when, when the uh, IT was just catching up and actually it was already in the catching up stage because 91, uh, 91, 92 was the time when things were just looking, India was uh, moving into the IT space. And that's where, you know, I started my journey from and very, very proud to share. I, uh, you know, I started my journey as a trainer and as a software trainer. And that has been the closest to my heart because when you interact with students, and when you interact, when you train them on something and then they make, make it uh, good in their life and they grow on that basis, you know, that's so fulfilling. So actually I started off my career more as a trainer. So spending time directly with the students uh, in the classroom and in the labs and working on various problem statements and, you know, the case study applications, how do we resolve? At that time, this was the time of COBOL and, you know, DBase and FoxBase. I, I don't know whether many of the students would even know this today, but this is the time which was very, very early time. Uh, at the highest was Sybase at that time. But this was the real time when we, uh, I, I worked with, with the student directly and moved into the the fundamentals of IT, which was more on databases, networking, you know, hardware, software, all, all that stuff. And then growing in the same, uh, same domain, and this is, this is where I started from NIIT, you know, as the organization. And from there, uh, the, the, my journey began. So uh, from training the students in the beginning, and maybe I'll, uh, if, I, if I take you to my last assignment at, at NIT, it was uh, heading the entire, uh, you know, the individual business for NIT. So that was the whole journey. But, but uh, just to give you the, uh, just to share some key points in the journey. Uh, first piece was completely the software training space. Then I moved into the, uh, into more, uh, which is PNL space, managing the PNL, managing the uh, uh, PNL as a unit of a center, and then moving forward into operations part. And then uh, as, as, as the time grew, uh, moved into research and technology area. So which was more to do with blended learning and uh, you know, the, uh, let's say the various models were emerging at that time because there is the synchronous model, asynchronous model and all this was getting evolved. 
and that time I, you know, I spent nearly three years with Dr. Sugata Mitra and, and the team working on uh, complete, uh, how should we really look at the pedagogy, methodology, and the whole aspect of, uh, uh, you know, asynchronous and synchronous learning. This was the time when technology was getting embedded into training field, uh, and it was, you know, allowing the training to scale. And that's where I spent good, you know, almost two to three years in that area at that point. Later started moving into uh, a pure management side, and that was more to do with uh, technology alliances. Got a very good opportunity working with Microsoft, Oracles, and Cisco's, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, these are the upstream partners who are the technology providers. And at the downstream, you know, working with uh, great organizations like Wipro, Infosys, uh, you know, Cognizant, and then all these organizations more who would absorb the talent which is produced. So this was a great experience, uh, you know, working on both the sides because this were the national and international level alliances which we had to work on and, and get, get them all together. Then I got a very good opportunity and which I must share today because that, that really paved my, my way in terms of career guidance. And I, I must mention this. This was the time when, uh, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was given the responsibility of ensuring that the student uh, who undergo the training are successfully placed in the industry. And this is where it started off from the complete career guidance uh, as, as a domain, uh, because when should it start? What should it have? And, and when does the career guidance, you know, actually it never ends, but at what stage, you know, does it uh, make the student ready so that he can clear the gate of the employer? And then what happens after that? And, and what is this, you know, lifelong career guidance model? So we started working on, and this was one, uh, one big uh, responsibility, which I handled for nearly, nearly five years. And that is the time, you know, uh, was very fortunate to, you know, nearly place nearly 200,000 students at that point in the IT industry. So that was the, my, uh, that, but it was a very enriching experience from student standpoint, as well as industry standpoint, because here is the demand and supply coming together. So that, that was a very, very unique piece, which came forward. Towards the end uh, of my 25 years with NIT, uh, I was I was I, I co-founded a new business vertical called Stackroot in Bangalore. This is in Kormangla, Bangalore, and this was uh, our proposition to how do we address the top of the end pyramid on the technology front? Because NIT, as such, was was more coming from uh, from let's say an individual business and then coming upwards. Here was an opportunity to work directly with B2B space and work directly with corporates. And this gave, gave us an opportunity to not only think through a completely new product, a completely new proposition, but rather taking it up to the absolutely to the top of pyramid in terms of uh, all of the induction program of Wipros and Infosys and, uh, you know, we Cognizant, uh, Mindtree. So these kind of organizations came forward. And we are, you know, very glad to report that it, it's 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 uh, on its way to growth as of now. And that was the time, you know, it was in uh, nearly five years back when I moved into uh, the skilling space with Vadwani Foundation. And this is my current role where I'm uh, I I look after the skilling uh, vertical. We call it Vadwani Opportunity, and I look after the skilling vertical, uh, you know, all across the globe, uh, except US as of now. And the whole journey here became much larger. Because here there was uh, here there was an aspect of working uh, absolutely in a philanthropic way, but then how do you really make an impact right at the bottom of the pyramid, middle of the pyramid, or top of the pyramid? But how do we really really make it big? How do we really work out and solve the problem of skilling in India? Uh, what is what is the right approach to do it? Of course, we are always learning. We are in the journey. But, but lots of learning along the way uh, in terms of uh, where are we, you know, what the gaps are, how it needs to be plugged. So from that standpoint, the journey has, you know, that's where I, I am today. And in terms of driving this in, uh, you know, right now in 11 countries, uh, which is India, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Africa. And that's the primary geographies where we are currently working on. And, uh, you know, glad to be here with you. Thank you so much. So this, I, I just thought, let me share this part with you.
Okay, and uh, uh, what is so interesting is that uh, for 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 the first twenty five years of your experience, uh, you have been dealing with corporates, and and uh, uh, typically it's like it's it's an organization for making profit, and after that, the last five years, it's uh, for a non profit organization. So, how was the switch in terms of the thought process, and uh, how are you coping up with this change and uh, is it really impacting the way you uh, conduct your functional area on a day to day basis okay so uh, frankly uh, the way we are today you know even though uh, you might hear us as a philanthropic organization but i must uh, must maybe give you an example to to say what i want to say uh, being a philanthropic organization we whenever we are working on a solution or a proposition for a student our key objective is to benchmark ourselves with the best available in the industry irrespective whether it is for profit or philanthropic or maybe a, you know an ngo the whole aspect is when it comes to student let's try to give the student the best possible solution not just the best available but the best possible so so with this kind of uh, you know dna in the organization so this gives uh, gives me and uh, all of us a very different thrill so what happens is when we are looking at uh, uh, you know you asked that question uh, the aspect right in the beginning moving from for profit to not for profit and moving and not only not for profit absolutely a philanthropic organization we we do not uh, you know get into any financial uh, you know dealing at all so moving from there to here and having this passion of giving the best possible product in the best possible way it could be because platform plays such a big role and then possibly the best possible analytics and the best possible in, in fact in the in a later stage we'll talk about best possible placement and the best possible career path for the student and as we continuously work on this with different geographies with different uh, in uh, you know kind of uh, Uh, i would say backgrounds of the countries economic background socio economic backgrounds are very different it's it's a very different challenge but as good as for profit uh, but doesn't matter whether whether it is actually for profit or not but that thrill of doing it absolutely professionally with customer or the student or the learner at the center always i think that's what is gives me a lot of uh, you know kicks and that keeps us going and the passion with which we our team drives this home uh, you know that's the i think that's where is the secret sauce so we that's where i think we, we all really rally towards this so just to understand uh, obviously most of the organizations work on a set of uh, annual objective or a five year goal or a 10 year goal yeah. so for vadhwani uh, opportunity or the vadhwani foundation what is your objective for the year 2022 let's say and if you also are okay to talk about what would be your five year goal uh, starting from 2022 sure so so let me let me uh, move in uh, in this way the whole objective uh, the mission which we had uh, without first getting to the numbers the mission was how do we ensure that a youth in the country and maybe the youth you know which could be at any level i'm not trying to say uh, you know primarily bottom of the pyramid then middle and then the top youth of the nation is able to uh, we enable this youth to be able to command family supporting wages so in in a simple line this would this is what it would mean but if i just drill down a bit this would mean can the youth very successfully uh, support a family of four people so so that's that's the second part and i i think somewhere later i'll explain this even more deep, more deeper and now coming to the mission which we have so so we started off with a mission of uh impacting 25 million youth across you know identified 22 to 25 countries mm -hmm. by 2030 and okay. we we need to take this 25 million youth across this journey of skilling and successfully landing them up into a into a job which is a family which is having a family supporting wages so while this was the long term larger perspective 
now let me come down because you know it, it uh, so for example for this to happen we need to be uh, you know we need to have a run rate of you know almost a million students uh, actually a million in india but otherwise roughly around one and a half million students in the next three years run rate uh, in the 11 countries where we are already working with and that's that's where we are in terms of uh, 2022 you know coming to coming to the last part of the question in terms of 2022 as of now on a yearly basis we 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 are supporting in india alone nearly around 300000 students that's what we do as of now and this is what we need to take to a million first run rate and then keep it for you know 7 to 8 years in india and then all the 11 countries put together and then growing the countries to 20, 20 to 25 that's how this uh, the entire dream of 25 million is what we are all driving towards okay so which means that if i understand uh, uh, you are currently at a level of about approximately about 33% from where you want to be Correct. Uh, especially in India and obviously for rest of the world also. Uh, I mean, the, the, the good part, of course, is that it is uh, being done through a, a philanthropic uh, organization. And here I would like you to actually talk a little more about your founder, uh, Dr. Ramesh Vadwani, uh, his journey and how this concept came up, uh, which is amazing. I think uh, India needs many more such uh, foundations uh, because... Uh, if we talk about India, uh, I mean, especially this is something I've been talking in many of my episodes. So between 1997 and 2011, uh, India has got roughly about 36 crore people. If these 36 crore people are not channelized in the right manner with respect to education, with respect to profession, and with respect to uh, 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 the different opportunities, then this be, this can become dangerously uh, problematic for country like India, and I'm I'm sure uh, uh, all the government agencies, all the foundations like yours, will definitely uh, make uh, take this as into cognizance and and work towards uh, these uh, particular cohort. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So actually, Dr. Ramesh Vadwani, you know, he is, he is our founder and, you know, so he was born in India and did his schooling in India. Uh, so he was born with, with polio and uh, from, from the age of, age of two, he has been, uh, uh, you know, polio has been with him. Uh, he graduated out of IIT Mumbai and then out of, after IIT Mumbai, he moved on to Silicon Valley. And, and before I go to that journey, let me just step back with a small... Uh, and that's where his first uh, entrepreneurial, uh, you know, mindset or entrepreneurial uh, first enterprise he set up from there. So it was, uh, you know, uh, it was as, uh, you know, getting his friends together because they wanted to have soft drinks. And then from there, how it became a business uh, model within the, it's, it was outside the college gate. And then it started growing so much that the college management res, uh, wanted it to get it inside. And then that was his first time when he, uh, you know, they all invested, you know, 100 rupees each or, you know, something like that. And then they, they then, then he was able to turn it around by selling it to the college. So there was a business setting up and then business selling right there in the college itself. So that was his first, first exposure. Since then, uh, he has never looked back. He always looked at look at the enterprises, evaluate them, work with them, turn them around, you know, absolutely from a non-profit making to a profit making uh, venture. And then, uh, you know, then leave the, uh, let's say, the venture uh, on a growth stage. So, uh, and very proud to say he has done, you know, 35 to 36 such organizations uh, all across the globe. And right now, in terms of uh, the, the entire symphony group, which is working today, which is uh, in the AI space, uh, you know, which we, we across the globe, it is, it is the business side uh, company today. And that's where he came up uh, with Vadwani Foundation. He said, now it's time that I should now be very, uh, and it, it is public where he said that, you know, I need to pledge, uh, you know, almost a billion dollar to be given back to the society. And this, uh, and the basic point which came in his mind was, high value jobs. So it started from the word 
high value jobs now if there is high value jobs there are only two ways you can address high value jobs one either by creating them two fulfilling them so if you want to if we need to create jobs there is a complete vertical towards entrepreneurship complete vertical towards msme you know supporting them so that these new startups come into uh, come into action they create more jobs and ultimately they will create high value jobs that's one part on the fulfillment part you know this was to do with opportunities like skilling opportunities and ensuring that the students join the jobs for family supporting wages but both you know map into the high value jobs right on the top and the clear objective is how do we uh, you know work in all uh, the developing countries and see how we can make this uh, his dream successful and that's where you know when I, i was just sharing with you about the numbers on 25 million this is to do on the side of fulfillment and like the same way there's another 10 million which is to do on the side of job creation so this is uh, his dream and we all are proud to be you know uh, associated with this, with this dream and we want we all want to make this happen uh, so that's what is driving us and that's uh, you know so ramesh uh, i think in a nutshell and very recently you know you must be aware he was uh, awarded padma shri and and you know he is uh, uh, you know guiding us today from you from uh, bay area and you know we are living the dream as as of now yeah that's fantastic and uh, now coming specifically to uh, you know because most of our uh, listeners and viewers uh, must will be from india who will be looking at uh, this video or or going to listen to this podcast yeah uh, and of course through your network probably we'll also reach out to other geographies as well uh, so why do you think is uh, the skilling is such a important area I, I, you did mention about uh, the the broad goal of 25 million people to be impacted positively yeah. uh, but why skilling skilling is so important and what exactly is the thought process see of course there are many uh uh many aspect of it you know we have been all talking about the demographic dividends you know we are talking about the supply side and the demand side the aging population in different countries uh and the whole aspect of the industry changing ever changing evolving industry we are talking about industry you know 2.0 3.0 now in fact uh, there are early talks about 4.0 5.0 all that thing is happening in parallel now the whole aspect is in spite of all this if you look at it from a broad level uh, even a country like india uh, it's very difficult to say that you know we will be uh, the uh, let's say as a country like india we will be producing the number of jobs which were required to take care of every individual who is today you know under the education system or or the passing out students because the number of jobs required is is x the supply is y so now that that opens up for us an an avenue in terms of what can we do to you know make this indian student a global uh, asset from that standpoint a global talent so that's that's one side of it the other side is very here and now almost whether you take india we take bangladesh philippines uh, indonesia i think uh, even 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 latam as well the industry and uh, academia there is always this that what industry says what we want we don't get and and may and and the other side there is academia who would say no we are doing the industry and those curriculum but still we are not able to produce the quality which industry can hire so so there is a gap on this part and and this gap when we go further double click and if i go into each sector you know it will come into roles and there are roles to be you know there are roles at levels you know where it where maybe a a grade 12 student is good enough to join there are roles where you know graduate students join there are roles where diploma students join and of course that itself is undergoing a change as well you know as we talk it's undergoing a change because uh, now the questions are coming why can't let's say a diploma guy do do coding he or she can uh, and can we move things uh, you know early in the value chain than than later 
So, so these various aspects put together, the demo, demographic dividend on the top, the demand and supply situation, uh, situation in the country, and another piece is how serious are we towards it? There are countries who are extremely seeing this as a very, very big responsibility. And the government and the countries, the, the, I would say, when I say the ecosystem of the country, be it government or private, uh, they are very serious about skilling, skilling and ensuring that every uh, individual is skilled. Uh, that's one part. Because there's the flip side to it. The other side is, if we do not address this problem, you know, this can create a absolute havoc, you know, because having uh, millions of unskilled students around, and and it's a, it's from that standpoint, it's, it becomes a threat for a future. So it's an absolute fabulous opportunity for all of us to see what does the student, how can they be skilled in the area which they like to be, uh, and then see what they can do the best, and then is it possible to take take them to the to the employer, or maybe they can get onto on their own, you know, and I'll touch upon that somewhere later on the self-employment kind of, kind of model, or maybe an entrepreneurship kind of model. So, so from that standpoint, uh, the whole gap between the industry and the academia today, the demands from the industry and what we need. Uh, and it is not only true about at the bottom of the pyramid, it's true right at the top of the pyramid, uh, even the best of the engineering, the engineering, uh, let's say total population in India, even now, most of the IT companies will say only, you know, 25%, the best rate would be 25% are employable and, you know, worse could be anything. So, so with such a huge opportunity in front of us, skilling is the only solution which comes, which comes forward. And that's where, you know, uh, we thought that we should then invest in this area. Maybe, maybe I, I'll just take a, uh, maybe at this stage itself, go one level deeper on this. Now, when we break the skilling piece, this also had got, has got two clear aspects. And we did a survey and I'm very glad to share with you this, this pure for India and my friends, you know, who are listening, uh, we did a, uh, you know, uh, uh, we met almost 1500 employers in India. And we, we do this, uh, you know, uh, on a periodic basis and try to understand uh, what do you look forward to when you hire a candidate, uh, you know, inside your organization. And I'm talking about entry profiles at this moment. And it's ranging across all these segments. It was, it was IT, IT, ITS on the top, you know, banking, finance, construction, healthcare, going right down to mining, maybe, maybe fishing. So we, we covered nearly around 30 domains. Uh, and then looked at the, what do they look forward to? And the output which came out was everyone requires domain skills. Everyone required soft skills. And that's where Vadwani op opportunity uh, thought that this is the sweet spot where we should start from putting the uh, philanthropic dollars and support the ecosystem where a lot of academia was anyway answering the domain knowledge. Correct. But at the interview, there's a big requirement of these soft skills. You know, all the aspects which is towards attitude, where confidence, communication, ethics behavior, uh, you know, problem solving attitude, all that aspect comes together. Because most of the employer would say, get us the right guy or girl, but we'll be able to then shape them in terms of domain. So that's where we started our journey. Uh, I, I just uh, touched upon this part, uh, you know, maybe this is not the question, but I just touched upon this yeah, part. Okay. That's where we got evolved uh, as, as Vadwani Foundation. And that's where we started our initial, uh, you know, the product or the proposition piece. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point because, uh, you know, uh, we all are aware that uh, the soft skilling part which you talked about i think along with the domain knowledge soft skill is something which is actually the differentiator uh, between uh, a person x and person y in my opinion obviously we should we should be starting this uh, concept of soft skill um, training or imparting this training right from the school level but unfortunately right now the education system doesn't have something like that uh, maybe there are there in few pockets, but I don't think it is there as a policy level kind of thing. So are you at the uh, Vadwani Foundation, Vadwani Opportunity, are you working with uh, the school system, with the boards 
or with the government how are you trying to reach out to the young people because i think uh, if we are able to reach out to people at school then you your dollar spent on this would be much more uh, effective and efficient actually what yeah, are your uh, thoughts yeah. so i yeah i must share something uh, very interesting here so after the we uh, after the end, end of the survey uh, they we found that there's a need of 21st century core employability skills so we we pulled under the bracket called 21st century skills and within that 21st century core employability skills which is sector agnostic and required by everyone but let me answer the question which you asked so so yes how do we uh, uh, you know this a product is there but how do you reach to the target segment and from that standpoint if school is the first uh, you know one of the one of the key target segment to be reached so what we what we were able to do and uh, very glad to share that we were able to work with the uh, you know ministry of education and working with the uh, pssaib or the the content part of ncert it's more known as ncert uh, and we worked with them to launch a vocational subject called employability skills and uh, and and uh, you know thanks to them that we were able to come together and launch this from grade 9 so okay, grade 9 10 11 12 uh, there's a you know we were able to uh, you know uh, introduce a subject as a you know as a subject called employability skills and this runs through all the schools which are which have registered for vocational education right now in the country but absolutely you know was to share with you from a from a uh, evolving or let's say going forward thought on this employability skills or you know we may call them workplace awareness we may call them work skills life skills all this aspect should start early in the student life and now i think as with the new nep coming forward new uh, the new education policy uh, while nep itself is uh, is clearly directing that uh, you know we should get these such skills early in the curriculum so right now you know we are working with with the ministry level and then further down you know creating some proof of concept with some uh, you know uh, pilots in terms of what can be done to you know introduce this early in the life of student and maybe uh, maybe it is it, if it can start from secondary section maybe secondary class starting from 6th onwards that's where you know we have been moving on this but i also would like to share with uh, you one more uh, you know a path breaking example uh, which also i think has a very long way to go uh, which is uh, we very glad to uh, participate with the uh, delhi government on the emc curriculum it's called entrepreneurial mindset curriculum now this also gave a very different touch to uh, to the aspect of uh, uh, how do you orient the student towards self employment or entrepreneurship you know even starting from find out the gaps around you and stuff like that but yes many states are now coming forward in terms of uh, may not be the same as emc in delhi but there are there are you know uh, other ways of uh, there are some more innovations getting added and then slowly this is taking shape and another i think i must add here there's a very welcome movement which we are seeing in almost uh, you know all the all the progressive states which is coming up with this uh, you know the the kind of uh, let's say a skill university kind of concept now it may uh, uh, when i say university it might sound like you know uh, let's say graduation but actually this is much early even a student can get on to this uh, just after grade grade 8 or grade 9 in the school so that's the kind of uh, uh, you know uh, kind of work happening and we are glad to be part of this and then working with uh, working with the government on this space which is on the school space of course there are you know the other side which is nsdc and and you know that's the other side but on school space this these are my thoughts on how we can really make an impact now in in the in the umbrella called national education policy and uh, with this new aspect how can we introduce these skills much early because the student confidence completely changes and they become that much more confident in taking all decisions in their life you know and and they are, they are they are more informed student rather than Uh, you know the current situation so that's where we are
Okay, so that's very good in terms of making some progress with respect to connecting with the boards, governments, and schools. But uh, how do you see others uh, uh, who may not have that particular school board as an access? So let's say a, a state government uh, education uh, children studying in yeah. the, uh, any of the states where this access may not be there. Yes. So what is the opportunity for them? Is there a is there a, a way they can actually reach out to this course through your uh, platform? Uh, yes, uh, actually, okay. I, 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 uh, I think I should have added this. Uh, while this is the way to address the, you know, uh, from the central body organization, we also, are, uh, you know, are working with the state governments. And right now we are, we are working with, uh, you know, five or six states in India. And we're taking this journey, not, uh, not only from the central leadership or the central organization, but also from the state leadership and the state organization. The only, uh, or rather the good aspect which come into when it goes to state, you know, it comes into, it takes the shape of uh, vernacular languages, uh, localization, when, which is required to be on the state. And then the kind of... Uh, um, in knowledge which is required by a student at the state uh, in terms of the industry available in the state locally as well as nationally you know that brings in that flavor and and definitely you know we would uh, we uh, as a philanthropic organization we are very very keen to take it to you know uh, as many states as possible but we are in the journey but at this point you know this is always an evolving space there are, there are states which are coming up with some revolutionary ideas of, you know, some leadership schools and they, and, and in fact, uh, they want to try this up. And this is, I, I'm here right now talking, talking about Jharkhand in terms of uh, the leadership schools as a, as a concept, like we spoke about EMC curriculum in Delhi. Uh, and like this, there are examples in West Bengal and Uttar Pradesh, uh, you know, big, big example happening here, Andhra Pradesh as well. Uh, Rajasthan and Haryana is something which we worked in the early early years, and and the whole. Now the good part is, uh, I, I would just like to say what is the best which has happened in the last two years, is schools opening up to uh, hybrid models of learning, uh, which was earlier you know a kind of uh, and thanks to the pandemic, maybe this has opened up uh, you know everybody's uh, you know scope of thinking that what how can training happen. It is not necessary that every training in the school has to be in the class. You know, there, there, are, there are models available where the students can learn, uh, you know, online. Yes, there is still device and bandwidth issues uh, in some parts of the, of, of the country, but every day it is reducing as we proceed. So whether it is the Northeast states or, or even North, West, even South, South, in fact, uh, you know, there are states which are very, very progressive in terms of bandwidth as well as devices. So as this gets better and better, schools are getting now, uh, you know, uh, I must share this example just before this call, you know, there is a, there's a project we are doing for, uh, this is for Uttarakhand. All the, all the teachers, you know, there, there's an induction program for all the principals first, then teachers, and then the students on uh, this synchronous and asynchronous model of learning. And it's coming from them that why don't we, uh, you know, train our people on this, maybe just conceptually with some examples, because now this is the best part, because as the economy and the school ecosystem opens up for hybrid learning, this opens a lot of scope for all of us. So that's the way, you know, we are thinking about schools, both in state as well as central, central and even private schools, you know, we also uh, help them as well. Okay. And also uh, if somebody, uh, a parent, is watching this and uh, his child uh, do not have that access because of whatever reason, maybe the state is not aligned or not part of the central board kind of thing. So do they have the access to this technology or to this learning through your platform? Absolutely. So uh, maybe this is a uh, 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 couple of months away, okay. uh, but we will be shortly uh, launching because currently we go uh, with the partner you know, which could be a school, could be a university, could be a state, could be central government uh, and private big players. However, they, we have seen a lot of uh, requests coming from individual students whose uh, institution may, may not have, you know, tied up with us. 
so working so we will be launching this as as a individual solution which any student in any part of the country and anywhere can come forward and do this at their own pace and uh, definitely uh, this is uh, maybe an, another two months away but very glad to share that that should be available definitely uh, in in let's say two months from now i think that will give a lot of scalability to this program as well exactly uh, i yes. think once individuals taste what you're talking about yes uh, they can actually influence uh, further for implementation uh, on a on a institutional level i guess exactly, exactly. so that's fantastic so so going forward uh, i just wanted to also uh, you touched upon the entrepreneurial uh, mindset uh, you spoke about the program in delhi uh, with the delhi government uh, would you like to share little detail about that and what exactly you mean by that and why it is so important for us yeah so uh, oh yes very very important actually see this is the uh, new learning and i must uh, maybe give you examples from different countries and this is for our you know and I, I this for students and parents uh, and the academicians you know who are listening to uh, to this conversation uh, if in india if there is a if there is a batch of 30 students and we ask them uh, and they might be in college or maybe in maybe in grade 12 maybe more more in when they are post class 12 and you ask them uh, you know uh, how many of you want to be working how many of you want to do a job you know we have seen on an, on an average 90 95% hands will go up and if i give you an example from a uh, from a latin american country like mexico uh, because i tried this myself and when we ask the students uh, how many of you would be interested or rather what do you see future jobs maybe only maybe only 20% hands will go up and 80% will be looking at uh, please enable us that we can be self employed first and then become an entrepreneur later uh, so so that is uh, so that's a big mind shift in the classroom because uh, one side is everyone is looking to be standing in the queue for interviews with the employer and the other one is uh, maybe a, a statement like to start with knowing what i can do i can start myself and later stage i can employ more people now maybe uh, you know at the bottom of pyramid it might sound uh, it will be more how do i get self employed and then uh, you know earn my living but maybe when you go to the middle of the pyramid students or top of the pyramid they can actually get on to real enterprise setup startups and then they can move forward from there so with this background you know we worked with the uh, uh, actually uh, a very interesting thing happened where it, where uh, you know it was like this that the number of jobs available will never be sufficient for the number of students passing yeah. out yeah and and if that is the case uh, and if we work on this developing the entrepreneurial mindset of the student so mindset is you know slight of course it has got a combination of communication problem solving teamwork all that is true but apart from this things like never give up things like uh, find out the gaps around you so if i give you a very uh, you know a very uh, let me give a real examples uh, students who are generally you know not attend uh, would may not attend the school very regularly would attend uh, such kind of topic you know very regularly and in fact uh, maybe without naming the state because this has now become everywhere uh, if the first period of the day is setting up entrepreneurial mindset for every student in the school from starting from grade 6 onwards you know that itself brings in a very different kind of learning and the learnings were immense student whose father was a e rickshaw puller suddenly this kid in class 9 or 10 tells his dad that uh, uh, your rickshaw e rickshaw is actually an asset and why do we earn revenue only for 7 hours let's earn revenue 24 hours now it might very very simple thing but student mindset becomes what can i leverage around from around me so now that kind of mindset uh, uh, coming from uh, finding out the gaps it was amazing to know the kind of gap student came up with and we would tell them uh, you know the objective was whatever you see around when you come to school from your house or what do you whatever you see around you know uh, maybe when you are walk talking to your friends going out what gaps do you see 
then getting them into a huddle of a group of four or five and then let them think about it. Objective was not truly that each one will launch a business. That was not the objective. Objective was let them huddle because this huddling itself and thinking of a problem someday in their life, they would feel that maybe I can do something. I can, I can find out a gap and do something about it. You know, a couple of girls from government schools setting up uh, it, you know, a two wheeler tire, uh, you know, you, you have to fill up the air in the two wheeler scooty, starting from their mindset and, you know, and then slowly somebody donating them a, a you know, a kind of a shed under which they started uh, helping the girls who are, who are getting scooties. And just to share with, uh, share with you today, they are part of Mahindra Electric today, the whole group of 12 girls. Otherwise, if it is automobile, generally the girls would, you know, have their own, you know, views about it. So these are those examples which if, uh, if driven early in the life, you know, then they can really, uh, you know, drive their passion or they can follow what they wanted to do. Yes, this has to be fully supported by the country, by, by industry, by the, by the governments in terms of, uh, you know, let them try and fail versus not even trying. That's the big part. I think if that can happen, you know, we uh, then I think the schooling system itself, not only school, maybe colleges, maybe maybe even further up, you know, the, the management colleges, the pharmacy colleges, this can give birth to many, many new ways of, uh, you know, many new innovations, maybe many new ways of at least finding out a self-employment opportunity or setting up a startup in case you can go to that level. So that's how, you know, this whole uh, entrepreneurial mindset became so important. And I must uh, just close it with one more aspect. Even when we were working with the employers, even they started saying, uh, we need to have this uh, startup mentality in the, in the student. And we asked them, what do you mean by startup mentality? See, let them try. Let them not become the process. I'll just keep on following the process. Let them try and fail, not to worry. We as an organization will support that. But let them not become like, okay, this is the process and nothing will change. Versus always questioning, trying new things and not giving up. And, you know, now when the industry was talking like this, so they don't literally mean that, okay, you know, this mindset is required uh, or rather what they're saying is this mindset is required even at the workplace. Not only, you know, if you set up on, the, on your own, but even at your workplace, you need, if you have this kind of mindset, your growth is going to be definitely faster. So I know it was a slightly long one, but yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, but then the traditional jobs are under threat. I think uh, uh, there's so many um, consulting firms who are predicting a lot of things, and yeah. uh, a lot of it uh, sounds quite logical. Actually, all most of the repetitive mundane jobs will actually be eventually be automated or or taken over by machines or robots. So uh, people have to really do things which are which are human and which which really needs a little bit of human thinking, the emotion and all that. So, um, and if the traditional jobs reduce, obviously, then uh, people will have to really be fantastically good at some exactly. special skill. Yeah. And uh, if they are good at some skill and possibly they don't have to stick to one particular job role, they, they could actually move around and do multiple number of contracts. And if that is what is the future for people, then I guess uh, uh, understanding yeah. entrepreneurship is also equally very important. What I, is I must share an example with you and I, I, I'm so uh, intrigued to share that with you. I was flying from Calcutta to Delhi and the young boy sits with me in the aircraft and he was uh, in his uh, you know early 20s, maybe 23, 24. And I was asking him, uh, uh, okay, where, where, what are you doing and all that stuff? And then he tells me, I'm going to London. I said, okay, they was flying to Delhi and then he was going to London. Then I asked him, okay, what, uh, what takes you to London for higher education or something? He said, no, we have a lot of tea farms in the uh, Guwahati area, that area. And now he's going there to learn uh, the entire drone technology and how, and then I asked him, what do you plan to do? He said, all my tea farm people will be, you know, I need to train them on this drone. Because I think we can manage it much better 
if they learn drone because they know what kind of leaf color is required when you know when it is right to cut that you know pluck that uh, tree or rather the plant the tea leaves from there so so imagine from uh, as you rightly said who could imagine a tea farm worker would be a, a drone specialist now so the way the uh, you know jobs are evolving the way the take the analytics part you know how it is now going everywhere in every domain uh, aips uh, you know how this is now fitting in, in in domains which were never heard of so those kind of things and and traditional jobs you know will be a question mark in in uh, you know the, i was attending a workshop or uh, rather uh, this was in manila and there was a global conclave talking about uh somebody made a statement that uh, the job of lawyer is also you know <laughs> it may also change tomorrow because of technology and there was a huge debate we are already talking about the auto driven cars you know auto automatic driven cars and no drive driverless cars in other words so so technology is going to be evolving and from that standpoint if our young generation today the students and they are aware and they rather than getting scared adapt themselves to the new opportunity of it because every new innovation will definitely give rise to new jobs new opportunities i was talking i must give share this example in healthcare i met this uh, you know there's there's a large startup organization which uh, who got into the home healthcare space home healthcare space was you know typically the issue has been if there's a girl uh, child she may not be interested to you know go to somebody's house the the wonderful way they have resolved it is now they have made a team of 3 and then working it like one supervisor and one maybe either two girls or two boys and they are now looking at you know hiring almost 10000 people every month so so suddenly the the home health care suddenly takes a different turn so so there are so many things which are evolving the entire analytic space whether you are in supply chain whether you are uh, you know in logistics analytics is everywhere whether you are in 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 terms of healthcare whether you are even in retail so analytics is something the students you know all of our learners parents should look at how that portion can be put in then in them right in the beginning so that they can take but absolutely coming back with the evolution of new jobs and and as we see the jobs which are going off uh, you know data entry operation for for that matter is is on the way out but rather there are many many new things which are emerging we never we never heard of you geo engineers was the concept launched by google so in fact and all these were those students who would bike very well uh, you know atm engineers these were the students who could uh, you know imagine that atm engineering the, the people who who the who are the first call away when the was the atm machine is down these are the people who are polytechnic and diploma holders who were the first one to rescue but then comes the real engineer after that so absolutely with you you know this opens up a huge opportunity for all of us yeah fantastic yeah. and uh, uh, two more uh, issues which uh, i thought we will uh, talk about you know there is this concept of rise of edtech in india so conceptually what exactly this means and what is the impact of this uh, going forward so edtech the way i look at it is uh, uh, in simple terms trying to put technology in education uh, and basically it take uh, from from a large standpoint is giving scale to with innovation so this innovation this scale this technology so and when it take is playing a big role and can play a very big role in transforming the education part so whether the it take is more in terms of delivery methodology that is pretty obvious but the bigger edtechs which edtech projects which are which are path breaking ones and maybe i i would like just like to share some of them uh for example uh learning pattern recognition of a learner there could be there could be five learners in the same class they are learning the same concept but uh, may, maybe a very crude example could be a teacher is teaching a particular topic and maybe just for the uh, for for an example sake even if it is even if the topic is photosynthesis now even this topic there is a kind of student in the class who can just watch a video and be done with it there are other kind of student who needs teacher to explain what it is 
and there could be four or five students who said okay we are just going out of the class we'll be back in 45 minutes and we'll know what photosynthesis is <laughs> so now now the whole aspect is it is uh, learner driven uh, so we are always of course you know uh, with the evolution of time with, with uh, andragogy and then pedagogy and now uh, you know as we move forward can this can the education become learner centric and a very uh, you know if i if i put it like this can a learner choose what to learn and can a learner choose how to learn and can a learner choose how do you ask, uh, assess me so uh, for me if you want to assess me the best way it may not be a written test yeah take me to the field and tell me tell me to do this i'll do it for you <laughs> so so from from that aspect you know this whole evolution which is happening now on this space so edtech is trying to address this part so uh, that's the revolution i think it can bring on the table you know as as we proceed further so sorry. fantastic and of course this this uh, sounds little futuristic but i think uh, this is the way way forward because uh, if we have to really address the problems of future probably the way we teach our, uh, our children have to also adapt and change faster than uh, than than uh, than what we have been doing sure. uh, so i mean that that leads her to the advantages of blended learning model so uh, if you can explain that to our viewers yeah so uh, yeah coming to the uh, you know it started from synchron synchronous and asynchronous models and then came the blended learning models uh, actually uh, you know in uh, so it is like this when we say blended learning model it's a combination of various aspects uh, technology face to face uh, query resolution through a bot query uh, or can you talk to somebody face to face <coughs> sorry so from the blended learning concept while in a simple terms it is blend of learning which is could be online offline uh, at your own pace or you know guided learning those those are the you know the typical understanding of what what a hybrid learning model would be however let's let's take this high, uh, hybrid learning to the next level so which is uh, if a student wants to uh, today if a student wants to learn guitar he can do this you know watching couple of youtube videos if a student wants to know you know how do you uh what is the best way to you know even let's say uh, uh you know wearing a tie and he doesn't know how to tie, you know put a knot youtube one video can do it now what needs to be done that means video should be part of this methodology or the hybrid learning then comes the next part which is to do with uh various ways if we have to collaborate using technology now collaboration can happen if you're in a classroom fantastic because there are people there and uh, you can have role plays you can have other stuff so i am right right now talking about the the methodology of learning and that's where you know this whole hybrid piece comes in now traditional way would be that there are three people uh, you know doing a role play in front of the class and other people other students are watching and then they are responding to that is the same thing possible through technology now can i define through technology that two people are uh, are having a conversation and maybe a heated conversation can i play one play one of the role of one of that person using technology and take and solve the situation so it's it's a combination of uh, the voice uh, the what you speak and on the basis of that what technology replies but the but can we do uh, such kind of thing in collaborations because today when the world becomes one village it is possible that trainers are not in a classroom trainers are divided they could be in different countries they could be in different cities they could be in different houses and still together so hybrid learning methodology or uh, you know this uh, uh, this kind of model can bring in solution for the for all types of learners so learners who are you know in classrooms learner who are on their own learners who have got a mobile phone which is very smart learners who has got got tabs and learners who are not connected 
you know, even going to that part. So hybrid learning in that form has to address all kinds of learners. And the day it goes on to, you know, learning pattern recognition and then responding on the basis of that, you know, frankly, then there is a, this is a, that will be the whole scale model for the world. So that's how, you know, I would, I would it's like. A, to... It's really sounds very, very futuristic. I think it's going to have a lot of uh, AI and ML Im embedded into this process. I think uh, so uh, that's, that's uh, really fantastic. So uh, before we, you know, uh, sign off, I wanted you to talk to uh, the target audience because uh, uh, I quite like the idea that there is a foundation which is wanting 25 million people, young people to be positively impacted for their future, for their life. And obviously in the process, create people who are economically uh, better for the society, for the world. I think uh, that's, that's something which is very good. So in this journey, uh, you obviously are doing a lot in terms of engaging with the government, with the schools, with the boards, with the states, and so on and so forth. So for the other stakeholders uh, who have not reached you yet, or you have not been able to reach out yet, through, through this channel, if I am able to bring at least one stakeholder onto this, I'll be ha very happy to, to have contributed to, the, to this uh, mission as well. Sure. So, so when, uh, yeah, so actually uh, you're very right because when I today look at the, the stakeholders with us, there is, there's a complete community, which is students community or learner community. And, and right now we are only captive because they are there in a, uh, somewhere, either they're in a school or they're in a college or they are, they are in a, uh, you know, skilling center, skilling university, or maybe they are with employers. Now, that's still captive. Uh, so from these, uh, this is the first target segment or the first, uh, you know, stakeholder with us. And we are, we are definitely very keen, uh, you know, to, to take it to every individual possible in his or her own language so that they can, they can choose the language and they can run it and, and not only India, but all the countries as well. So from, from this point of view, we, uh, we were envisaging a first uh, kind of uh, a global skilling uh, you know, online global skilling university kind of model. Now that that's just an imaginary uh, imaginary which we can form. The the basic part is is it available to every student everywhere? So this is something you know we would be uh, uh, you know very glad to share with you. But uh, you know it is some months away. But we will be launching this and we will reach out to every target student uh, you know ourselves. So whether it is through social media. Uh, through, through various media uh, routes, but we will reach out to the students and please always uh, one request to all, all the students would be uh, visit the, uh, you know, Vadwani, uh, uh, Vadwani Foundation website that that will be that will always be, you know, you will always find something for you any which way, because, for example, today, if you go to the Vadwani Opportunity website, you will still uh, you will you will get to know about domains subdomains, what is the growth path? And it has got nothing to do with whether you register or you don't, it's, it's a knowledge for you. So please, uh, you know, be there. Another thing which I can share with you is uh, very shortly, we will have a mobile app for you. So completely downloadable on your mobile. And then, you know, you can get, get going from there. And Vadwani, uh, Vadwani Foundation will become a kind of a buddy with you right from school until you're working. And, you know, uh, we'll be supporting you all throughout journey. And maybe, maybe, maybe a coach, a buddy, you know, who is there to help you. So that's my message for the for the first uh, stakeholders and the most primary one, which are the talent or the students. The second one is is very important. Is this is the trainers, and trainers is is it's a big part of the puzzle, and they need to be always trained. And so we we have uh, for the trainers per se as well. While we, we do the master, you know, uh, training of master trainers, training of trainers all across, and we are cre creating a community of global trainers all across. And then some, uh, you know, within few, maybe few months or maybe six months from now, uh, in, an Indian student wants to interact with a trainer who is not from India, very much possible. Or at a point when you have a doubt, 
there are trainers uh, you know which are available from a different nation fair enough same way you know so that's the entire community on trainers but here i want to address a point that we will look forward to even co creation of solutions with the trainers so why uh, you know we welcome their contributions in this journey as well so that's the that's the second uh, key stakeholders with the trainers then comes the entire partners whether it is the channels we call them whether it is uh, schools whether it is uh, boards colleges so so very specifically we will be you know we will be reaching out from once from through the social media in terms of uh, you know at least in india we can our plan is to go to the district level you know as we move forward but uh, i think uh, that's the way forward you know in terms of this part and most important the last part is the biggest stakeholder called employer Uh, and with the employer you know we we continuously engage with them and more to know two things one what is happening to jobs i think uh, sir as you rightly said which is the role fading out and which is the role emerging now it is our responsibility to take it to the uh, to the supply side and and train them early before you know we realize it's too late so that's one part and the second part is working with their employees on on the on the soft skills required at the workplace so that's how you know we are addressing all the key stakeholders okay fantastic so uh, viewers and listeners uh, i i really sincerely wish that uh, uh, whenever it is possible for you to do visit the vadwani foundation website Uh, and the vadwani foundation and the vadwani opportunity website as well uh, and i i myself uh, i've seen quite a few uh, very very interesting youtube videos also where i've seen uh, mr sunil dhaya speak my, i've seen mr Ram, uh, dr ramesh vadwani speak and and there's so many other speakers uh, and also a lot of uh, um impacted stakeholders i would say people who have gone through the process the, how positively they have got impacted i think i saw those videos also found it very very interesting so i sincerely wish uh, that uh, vadwani foundation uh, does create that uh, positive in- impact for india as as well as across the world and and make uh, the world a much better place with respect to this skilling and in a, in a small way if india career center can contribute to that i'll be really happy with that so with that uh, i thank you mr sunil dhaya for giving your time today uh, for this uh, talk so it it was pleasure on this side thank you so much and and all the listeners uh, wish you all the very best and please stay in touch we vadwani foundation i, I think uh, is always there for you and we will always be looking forward to you know how we can support you better and better thanks a lot and it was lovely talking to you thank you thank you hope you enjoy this episode we sincerely wish you could take something from our conversation today and be able to apply it to your life in a positive way we value your feedback this can help us improve our future episodes so share your thoughts to serve you better if you want us to focus on a topic which you think is of importance let us know we will share our expertise in future episodes so see you soon with a new topic and help you in your career journey